Uh, as I do every day, I like to come before you at 1 o'clock and provide you with the best information that we have so that you can stay informed as this crisis drags on. Um, education is key. Education is key to keeping yourselves calm and healthy, keeping your family calm and healthy. So I hope you are able to tune in at 1 o'clock, breathe a sigh of relief, and come away with a sense of confidence that we here in the state of Rhode Island are doing everything we can and, and keeping everybody safe and as safe as we're able to do. Uh, you will see the data on the screen, um, hopefully it's there now, that our cases are remaining steady, and that gives me great confidence. Uh, unfortunately, we saw a bit of an uptick over the weekend in hospitalizations and ICU um, occupancy, so obviously we don't want to be seeing that. We wish that that were going down. But overall, it is a, it's a very stable picture. We are not out of the woods, but we are experiencing a favorable trend in that we seem to be having a plateau. So I want to begin by saying thank you to everybody who's worked so hard to make that happen. Thank you to all of you who've been in quarantine, isolating yourselves, wearing your masks, staying home, however difficult that's been. Um, closing your businesses. It's been really hard, but it's clearly working, and you should feel personally, you know, responsible for having contributed to these great results and the fact that we, we haven't seen the level of hospitalizations and mortalities that we could have seen. And I would say, as I say, we're not out of the woods, and I, I wish we hadn't seen that uptick of hospitalizations, but I, I feel confident that we're in a plateau, and that is a good thing. Uh, and Nicole will go into the details a bit more about the numbers. So today I want to focus, I said I would today, focus essentially the entirety of my comments on how I'm thinking about uh, reopening our economy. And so I'd like you to bear with me for the next few minutes while I lay out um, how I'm thinking about it and the phases that you might be able to expect in the coming weeks and months. Last Monday, I spoke about the six key indicators that we are watching as we make decisions around reopening the economy. And uh, every day I look at the data as it relates to those six indicators. And I talk constantly to our public health experts, other governors, the CDC, and gauge where we are along those six indicators and, and are we doing the right thing using the best data, using the best guidance from the experts. Uh, I think you know that the last thing I want to do is to keep anybody out of work one minute longer than necessary. Uh, I have spent my whole governorship working to get Rhode Islanders back to work. And I commit to you today that I'll do whatever it takes to stand this economy back up. But it's going to have to be done slowly and incrementally, but we are going to stand this economy back up and we are going to come out the other side of it stronger, more innovative, and more resilient than we were when we went into it. And together we're going to do that. By the way, no one's ever done this before. And I hope no other governor ever has to do it. Shut down an economy and reopen an economy. So, you know, we're going to have to be slow and methodical and careful. We're going to have to exercise a lot of judgment, but we're going to do it. I stand before you with total confidence that we're going to get you back to work as quickly as is safely possible. And I want to commend and thank the leadership of uh, Stephen Pryor. He and I talk a hundred times a day. He is on it. He has been working truly 24-7 talking to public health experts, talking to his colleagues in other states, talking to industry associations, talking to business leaders, and together we feel that uh, we're going to be able to do this, to stage our economy back, back up to a place where it's thriving and we really do believe on the other end that it's, we're going to be stronger. We're going to have businesses be more digitally uh, competent. We're going to have people have more skills. We're going to have small businesses start to become more technical. There's going to be new innovations that come out of this. And we're together going to get from here to there. 
So let me tell you um, what my goal is. My goal is to be on May, to stand here in two weeks from today and tell you that I'm lifting the stay-at-home order. That's the goal. That's everybody's goal. Make that your goal. Let's commit to each other, every one of us. We're going to do whatever it takes as a state, as individuals, and as your leaders to make it so that on May 9th, I can say I've lifted the stay-at-home order. That's not guaranteed. If you guys all go out today and go back to work, slowly go back to work, slowly leave your homes in the next two weeks, I will not raise the stay-at-home order because I won't be able to because we're going to see a spike. But if you hang in there for the next two weeks, hunker down, stay home, work from home, don't leave your home, do everything you've been doing, I'm going to stand here in two weeks and say, time to enter phase one of our economic recovery and time to lift the stay-at-home order. Um, a few notes. We're in a little bit better shape than some other states as it relates to reopening our economy because we never closed manufacturing and we never shut down construction. So you may be hearing, like New York announced over the weekend, they're going to start with reopening manufacturing. Well, we never closed manufacturing, because the whole time I've wanted to maintain as much of the economy as possible. So we are a little bit ahead of the game, and construction and manufacturing have continued safely, thank you guys, and they will be able to continue. We're also in a good position because we are, we, our testing capacity is, is in a good place, better than most states, and getting better every day. Contact tracing is in a good place, getting better every day. I'm going to have updates on both of those later this week. And our, what I would call our safety net in our field hospitals is built and in good shape. This morning I was over at the Rhode Island Convention Center. It's unbelievable, amazing. It isn't a field hospital, it's a hospital. I would feel confident if I were to get sick and wound up at the convention center, I would feel confident that I could be treated there. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who made it happen. So the thing is, we've spent the last few months weathering the storm together and getting ready. And I feel that we're very close to being ready. The hospitals are ready, testing is ready, the environment is ready, we're learning how to deliver meals to people in isolation, we're going to make sure we have enough adequate housing for homeless folks in isolation. We've been building, and all of that is important. Um, and so I'm trying to give you some confidence. I need you to have some confidence that I, wouldn't hit, I won't allow us to reopen and go back to work unless I'm sure we're ready and, let, and I know we've got a system in place to take care of everybody. The mantra through this is planning, flexibility, and adaptability. That's what our mantra's been from the beginning, and that's what it's going to be now. It's not going to be a flick of the switch. I am not going to come here on May 9th and say, everybody go back to work, back to normal. That is not going to happen. It's going to be slow, pinpointed, gradual. We're going to do a little, collect the data, do a little more, collect the data. If it looks like we're getting into trouble, I'll pull us back. We're going to do it together, flexibly, safely, and balancing public health with the very real needs that people have to get back to work and get a paycheck. Um, so I'd like you to put the timeline on the screen, please. And I want to take a second to go through how we think about it. We are, by the way, you'll notice a nautical theme. Um, we're the ocean state, so we're trying to go with the, with the nautical theme. Phase one, or the first bit, is weathering the storm. Man, are we going through a storm. We've been through that storm. We've, we're hanging tight together, and we're getting through it. Our goal, ultimately, is to land at a new destination. And as I said in the beginning, we're going to get there. And we're going to surprise a lot of people at how well we get there, how quickly we get there, and how much stronger and more resilient we are when we get there. To get from here to there, we have to go through a few phases. Today I'm going to provide a rough outline of those phases and how we think about it. In the days and weeks to come, I'm going to fill in the details on this rough outline. 
everybody can go to reopeningri.com. That's where this presentation will live. And as we update it with more information, more regulations, industry by industry guidelines, it will be at reopeningri.com. We're going to add to it um, over time as we have more information. We're also going to be taking your feedback on this site. I want to emphasize we are in this together. No one's ever done this before, so we have to be talking to one another. I'm going to be making decisions. You're going to be reacting to them. If it's not working, if you need help, you got to let us know so we can adapt. This is about, this is an adaptive recovery. We're going to be doing a dance for the next 12 months. There's no, nothing in cement. So you have to get comfortable with a bit of flexibility, changes, um, working together in a more flexible, collaborative way, be accepting changes as they come based upon the data on the ground. So it was important to me that we have an ability to take your feedback on the website. The first phase is what we're calling testing the waters. We're going to put our toe in the water together and test the water and see if we, how much we can do. If I'm able to lift the stay-at-home order on May 9th, which I really hope I can, we're going to move into the testing the waters phase one. During this phase, we're going to be able to resume some social activity and some business activity with significant restrictions in place. We are planning to limit the gathering size of social gatherings from five to ten people. Office-based businesses um, ha will have to continue to emphasize working from home. Anyone who can work from home in phase one must work from home in phase one. However, we're going to be allowing some limited number of employees back on site under new guidelines, and we'll be sharing those guidelines next week. Working parents will have some very limited options for child care with strong social distancing guidelines in place, additional PPE, additional cleaning protocols. At first, the number of child care slots that are open will be very limited, and then we will continue to grow. So I want you to start getting your head around that. This is not May 9th, everybody goes to work. May 9th, if we do this right, May 9th and May 10th, aren't going to look that different for May 7th and May 8th. A few more folks can go to work. All of the business people, and there are many, many, who are at home now, you know, lawyers, accountants, HR people, engineers, everybody who's working from home now is going to continue to work from home on May 9th. Very limited exceptions to come back into the office. If you have an office job, chances are you can work from home and you need to continue to do that. In, in the, this phase one of testing the waters, just to give you a visual of what it looks like, if you have gone into the office for some limited period of time, maybe on the way home you can run some errands. Retail stores are going to be able to add in-store pickup um, in addition to the existing curbside pickup and delivery. Over a bit of time, you might even be able to do some browsing on a limited way at certain retail stores with strict regulations. If you want to get dinner from a restaurant, you're still going to have to rely on takeout and delivery. But towards the end of phase one, we might start to work with restaurants to pilot options for uh, in-house dining, including outdoor dining. We're also going to be looking at limited pilots in the end of phase one for hairdressers and barbers. That's a maybe, but we want to see if we can get there. Um, guidelines are going to be put in place so medical offices that have reduced in-person hours or have closed now, like behavioral health therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, they're going to start to reopen in phase one. Pilot reopenings of dentist office will also begin in phase one under strict regulations, and the Department of Health has a special program for dentists. And we're going to see limited reopenings of parks and open spaces and beaches with new restrictions in place. So um, think about it. Now, I want to be very clear. 
I'm taking a little bit of a risk today because I'm telling you today what you might be able to do two weeks from today. So I'm trusting you. I'm doing it because I want you to start to think about it and get prepared. I felt it was important that families, small businesses, businesses have a couple weeks to get their brain around what life might be like. Here's the risk I'm taking. If in the next two weeks you start to violate the stay-at-home order, then we're going to see an uptick in hospitalizations and then I'm not going to be able to lift that stay-at-home order. And that would be a shame because if everyone continues to stay at home for the next couple weeks, we are absolutely on a path to start getting you back to work in a couple weeks. Also, in a couple of weeks, if we can go from five to ten people in a social gathering, I need you to use some common sense. Don't start planning dinner parties in your house every night for different ten people. That would be a bad idea. You know, you, you, can, ha you can see your family a little bit more. But still, limit the number of people you're with. You shouldn't be seeing a different 10 people every day. This is a tiny increase in our flexibility, designed to allow us to be with our family and friends and get commerce going again. But really, we have to be smart about it and incremental about it. If we're smart and incremental and we don't overdo it in phase one, then we're going to move to phase two, which we are calling navigating our way. Phase two is all about new models for businesses. More businesses will be open, restrictions will be further relaxed, you'll be able to go out to eat at more restaurants, you can get your hair cut, you can go shopping at more retailers. It will still be different. It's all going to look different. When you go to the restaurant, there'll be, you know, um, there may or may not be menus because men, you know, and there certainly aren't going to be reusable menus. That you may see half the chairs in the restaurant removed. You may, uh, it's going to be very different. You will have to wash your hands. You w may only be limited to a certain period of time you can stay in the restaurant. You're going to have to wear your face cloth coverings. So again, I want you to start to realize that. In the um, Navigating Our Way Phase 2, additional child care options will be available. Office-based businesses can invite more of their workforce back into the office. Social gatherings will get a bit bigger. And at this point, we're thinking we'll probably go from gatherings of 10 to gatherings of 15 people. If we get through that and things look stable, then we'll move to phase three, which we're calling picking up steam. Then we'll have some real confidence that we know what we're doing. We've learned how to live with the virus safely. We can operate commerce under a new set of restrictions, and we can pick up speed. So, you know, we'll know, frankly, we will learn from our mistakes. We'll know what's working and what's not working, and we'll be able to adjust our approach accordingly. We'll be able to loosen even more restrictions on businesses, increase capacity at restaurants and stores and offices, have larger so social gatherings. We're thinking in this phase as many as 50 people. Um, having said that, everywhere you go is still going to feel different. And um, it goes without saying that places, places that rely on big crowds Conventions, sports gatherings, uh, music events are going to be the very, very last phase. Um, and, you know, we will get there when we get there. Phase three, picking up speed, isn't the end of the road. You know, there's going to be a phase four. There's going to be a phase four that will allow us to do some of the bigger congregating, be a little bit more relaxed as it relates to folks who are seniors among us, and we are going to get there. Phase three isn't the end of the road. Now I want to emphasize, today I have laid out how we're thinking about it. Although it may seem simple to you, it has, what is before you represents a gigantic amount of work, thought, consultation, and effort. And it's also very much um, a set of guidelines which is subject to change at any moment depending on how the information changes. My 
goal through all of this is to give you accurate information, to give you as much notice as I can, to prioritize getting as many people back to work as fast as possible, safely, and to keep you updated, and to at all points tell you what you need to do in order to keep yourselves, your families, and your employees safe. That's the goal. Um, and it's going to be gradual. That's all I'm going to continue to say. It is going to be gradual. Through all of the phases, all of the phases that you've just seen, one through three, if there's another spike, we're going to have to pull back. I hope we never again have to get to a place where it's a complete pullback, but I can't promise you that won't happen. It's happened in many of the countries, and it may happen here. And if it happens, we'll do it. And if we see a spike, we're prepared to deal with it. Through all the phases, you're going to be wearing masks. You're going to have to stay six feet apart. You're going to have to be constantly washing your hands, using hand sanitizer, and trying not to go out more than you need to. If at any time during any of these phases, you find, up until phase three, you find yourself in a crowd, you are doing something wrong. That's how I think about it. It's simple. If you're in line someplace and you're in a crowd, if you're at work in a crowd, around the water cooler in a crowd, stop, time out, doing something wrong, give yourself six feet. Um, I hope that that is helpful. The question that's probably on everyone's mind is, okay, how do you know we're going to be ready to go to phase one? How do you know you're going to be ready to go from phase one to phase two? So let me offer you our best thinking at the moment around how we're approaching that. To move into phase one and to move from phase one to phase two, we need to see a 14-day downward trend in the number of cases or a 14-day trend in stable or declining hospitalizations. Now, some of you, I'm sure, are going to say, but Governor, we're not seeing a decline now. That's why I'm saying decline or stabilization. And we have our eye firmly focused on those hospitalizations. We're also watching ICU beds and other metrics as well. In addition to that, we need to be prepared uh, to mitigate community spread. So what does that mean? What are the other metrics that I'm going to be looking at? We need to be able to test every symptomatic person within 48 to 72 hours. We need to make sure we have enough testing in communities that are vulnerable and that have been hardest hit. We need to be running a consistent random sampling to keep track of the virus's spread. And we need to be ensuring that the overwhelming majority of contacts are traced within a day. We also need to be confident we have everything we need for healthcare workers and anyone in quarantine. That means sufficient PPE, at least 30% available ICU capacity, and complete confidence that we have services in place to get groceries and other essential supplies to individuals who need to be in quarantine or isolation. Finally, we have to have fully developed workplace guidance and regulations to ensure we have appropriate new restrictions in place with enforcement mechanisms, and we need to be constantly tracking the data to know if and when we need to reimpose some of our restrictions. Now, I'll be honest, we're not there yet. My team and I, we have a mountain of work to do in the next couple of weeks if I'm going to be able to let you go back to work in some way on May 9th, because we aren't there yet. We, according to these metrics, can you test everyone within 72 hours? Do we have rock solid confidence we can test the hardest hit? Uh, can we do the majority of contacts within one day? We're not there today, but we're going to work around the clock so that we are there by May 9th. Um, and then at each stage, we're going to look at those metrics again to make sure, that, you know, some of it is how are we doing with the surge, that's hospitalizations and cases, and then the rest of it is, is the system ready? We have to be ready at every stage for increased volume before we can move from one to two and two to three. Um, 
The, the key is flexibility. The name of the game here is flexibility. So every week, I'm going to come before you and come back to you and update you with our progress, and any adjustments that we might have to make will be based on data. And it will be my goal, obviously, to not make a lot of changes. The, the hope is that we'll set something out and then operate for phase one, and then I can tell you when we can go to phase two. But I also know that we're learning every day about the virus and how this is going to go, and we've never done it before. So I promise you at the end of every week, I'll let you know where we are, whether we have to make any adjustments, and when I think we'll be able to move to the next phase. And as I stand here now, I feel confident if everyone keeps doing what they're doing and if we keep working to ready the system, that on May 8th we can let expire the stay-at-home order and begin to move into testing the waters. Uh, well, one last thing before I turn it over to Dr. Nicole. Every day I've been mentioning the high incidence of coronavirus that we're seeing in the Latino community. And again, that relates very directly to what we're talking about. We have, we have to keep our eye on vulnerable populations. So I wanted to remind everybody that tomorrow night at 7 o'clock I'll be holding a live Facebook town hall with Commissioner Infante Green in English and in Spanish. It's an opportunity for us to hear from members in the Latino community. We want to know what you're worried about, what you need, how we can better support you. And of course, the Commissioner is going to be able to answer any of your questions as it relates to distance learning and also some of the plans we're getting in place for the summer.